for coming out. Um, to uh, friends, colleagues uh, that are here tonight, we're very excited that uh, this is one of the uh, first partnerships with uh, the Gil Gilbrea Center. And uh, Amanda will be speaking to you uh, shortly. Um, and so, really want to thank Amanda, we call Amanda the second, for organizing the, this uh, uh, day with uh, uh, David from uh, the Jarrah Center. I'm delighted to um, be able to introduce uh, Beatrice Kemp uh, Knanen, who's going to say a few words about her husband. Uh, very. Uh, this community has a really strong um, uh, leadership in aging. Uh, I was uh, surprised to see that uh, we were the first center here at McMaster that led the gerontology, had the first program, and one of the leading uh, areas that developed geriatric medicine uh, started here at McMaster. So, without much further words, um, Beatrice is going to share an amazing story about her husband, Carl Knannan, um, and also an amazing story of her own. Uh, she worked as the director of Catholic Children's Aid Society here in Hamilton. Right? Yes. And uh, she worked very hard uh, regarding the children at risk in our communities and lobbied strongly for them. So, and is obviously continuing to lobby for older adults as well. So welcome. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to introduce my husband, Carl Kananen. Uh, when I asked Carl if he wanted to say, me to say anything on his behalf, he said, keep quiet. I don't want any attention to myself. <laughs> and that's typically Carl. So I hope he'll forgive me for a few words of recognition. The Carl Kananen Lecture was established in 1992 when Carl retired, and it was recognizing his contribution to help found the gerontology program at McMaster University. Carl began teaching social work at McMaster uh, in the late 60s, and it was in the mid-70s that he began, began educating others about the particular needs of older people. It really concerned him that many of his social work experiences exposed him to neglect of older people and that our educational system didn't recognize the special concerns of the elderly. He believed that the interests of older people within many organizations that he was in contact with took more priority and he saw a need to develop special approaches in working with them. It also concerned Carl that Canada had the largest percentage of institutionalized persons of any other country, particularly because their seniors didn't have many services readily available to them in their homes. So by developing courses in gerontology, Carl hoped that formal studies in aging would awaken the need for more professional services and create awareness of the importance of encouraging interest in older people. He wanted to provide knowledge of the aging process, plus awareness of the particular needs of the elderly. He wanted us to learn to give direct, practical help to seniors. Carl also organized experiential learning by providing students the opportunity to work with older adults. At the same time, he asked older people to volunteer to participate in gerontology courses at the university as senior tutors. These tutors would share their knowledge and experience about life and aging, and they acted as positive role models for meaningful, creative aging. Carl's goal was that our older years be fulfilling and satisfying, living in cooperation and intimacy with our fellow beings, whether it be in our own homes, in communes, large extended families, small homes for older people, and other institutions. Carl now suffers from Alzheimer's. I've been assisting with his care for several years, and although I sometimes worry that there's more I could do to ensure his fulfillment, I take comfort in knowing he still enjoys life and that he is loved. And your presence here this evening also assures me that Carl's efforts to recognize the special concerns of the elderly continue to be appreciated and developed. 
So thank you for coming, and I hope you enjoy Dr. Mark's presentation. Thank you. the dynamics of looking at kind of medical practices with older people and the social issues and the kind of social experiences uh, that can be seen through photographs. Um, so looking forward to uh, your talk. So a few words about uh, our speaker tonight. Uh, Dr. Mark uh, Novichinsky is an assistant professor in the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Toronto. He's involved in teaching, training, research, and program development relating to primary, uh, sorry, home-based primary care. He began practicing medicine in 1992, and in 1998, he began to photograph the hidden world of his housebound patients in order to raise awareness and advocate for change. In 2007, the home-based care of frail, de, frail, sorry, frail elderly seniors grew into his main clinical interest and served as a starting point for the Interdisciplinary House Calls program that he'll speak about tonight. Mark's photo documentary project has been profiled nationally in print, radio, and television media, as well as in the Gemini award-winning National Film Board of um, Canada documentary film, House Calls. A solo exhibit of the photographs, House Calls with Mark Camera, opened at the Royal Ontario Museum in 2010 and remained on display for over a year. So we're delighted to have Mark joining us uh, tonight to talk more about his work. So please welcome, uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Mark uh, Novichinsky. Well, thank you, uh, thank you very much. It's uh, it's uh, an honor to be here tonight to be invited to give the Carl Kinnaman lecture, and I, I thank the uh, Gilbrea Center and the Jarrah Center for inviting me. So today's presentation is, is about the development of a, of a home-based primary care program in Toronto called House Calls, but it's, it's really about the need to look differently and, and, and to develop a different approach to caring for the elderly in the community. And it's also about how photography inadvertently made some of this happen. So you're going to see a lot of pictures that I'm not going to have time to talk about. So that's kind of like just this visual subtext. And um, this all started uh, over 35 years ago in in high school, uh, where I started a love of photography and uh, was exposed to doing social service. And I had no idea that later those two uh, passions would uh, would be united. And uh, Ontario politics played a, a key role in all of this. And in uh, between 1995 and 2003, we had the, uh, the so-called common sense revolution. And during that time, home care resources were dramatically shifted from chronic supportive services for seniors. A lot of that funding was shifted into post-acute home care, getting people out of hospital faster uh, at the expense of providing chronic support services to seniors. So I saw a lot of my patients lose their home care services. And this was a horrible and hidden uh, tragedy. And that's what um, spurred me to pick up my camera and start to document the hidden lives of my patients. At that time, in the late 90s, uh, building more long-term care beds was seen as the solution to caring for seniors. And 20,000 new beds were brought on street in Ontario. We have about 70,000 long-term beds in Ontario, I think. Long-term care beds in Ontario. And uh, by 2003, we had a chronic supportive uh, home care system that was more fragmented, more episodic, more inadequate. And, uh, and we had a no vacancy long-term care system. Because if you don't provide home care to people, they're going to end up in long-term, they're going to end up in hospital care. Home care keeps people out of long-term care. 
And uh, after 2003, the approach has attempted to be uh, more of an aging at home uh, philosophy. Now we're in the midst of an election campaign and the future is a little murky. So who knows what direction we will go in from here. Uh, Levin Burton, two giants of American geriatrics, have written that in a healthcare system that is becoming increasingly fragmented, home care can help bridge gaps in the continuum of care. And that's a very powerful statement. Marcus Hollander, a Canadian healthcare economist in Victoria, has uh, done a lot of work to look at the uh, cost effectiveness of home care, and the preventative aspects of home care. And he's written that long-term home care may in fact be an important part of the solution to making our overall healthcare system more efficient and effective and, it and enhancing its value for money. The option of aging in place requires a robust chronic supportive home care system. And the, the tragedy in Canadian healthcare is that home care is not covered by the Canada Health Act. There's actually, there are no national standards for home care. And so home care is really the poor, the poor cousin of the healthcare system. And, uh, and Doris is not impressed. <laughs> Uh, Ontario Home and Community Care has been chronically underfunded and it still represents less than 5% of our $50 billion health care budget. And as a photographer, I can tell you that a tripod needs three strong pillars for stability. And the Canada Health Act has given our health care system two strong pillars, hospital care and physician services. And we need that third strong pillar of, of home care and based primary care. In 2007, the uh, Ontario government introduced the Aging at Home strategy, which was a four-year, $1.1 billion initiative that would, quote, transform community health care services so that seniors can live healthy, independent lives in their own homes. That was very exciting to hear that. Unfortunately, the aging at home strategy uh, became increasingly focused on, on downstream problems, on emergency room wait times and the alternative level of care patients, what we used to uh, term inelegantly bed blockers. So the aging at home strategy became reactive versus preventative. And what the system really needed was more upstream investment in services and care for seniors in the community that would decrease delay and prevent 911 calls, ER visits and hospital admissions and, and long-term care placement. We think of house calls as belonging to a bygone era, the horse and buggy days, or you know, you're in 1948 in a, a Life Magazine essay on the country doctor, Dr. Cherry Adding became a house call. And even the Globe and Mail called this old school doctors. So uh, there's nothing old school about the family practice resident seeing that very same patient in the Golden Mail photograph. And, uh, but the, the history of house calls is interesting. In the, in the 1930s in North America, 40% of all doctor-patient encounters were house calls. And uh, you know, within, within 50 years, that had pretty well dried up and continued to dry up further through the 1990s, at a time when uh, home care was rapidly expanding. And home care is the fastest growing healthcare sector, and what this tells you is the medical community has become disconnected from home care. So why don't physicians in Canada make home visits? <coughs> well, part of it is that our training has become very centralized, healthcare delivery and training very highly centralized. And delivery of primary care has become largely office-based, and there's a lack of training and exposure to home-based care. We need more role models and mentors. And there are, across the country, there's a lack of incentives for, for physicians to do home visits. It's much more cost-effective for a doctor to just stay in their office and wait for doctors, for patients to come to them. 
to actually travel between house calls and spend more time with patients because they're more complex really is the best way to build a poor business case for practicing medicine that way. So we now have in Ontario, as of January, uh, the care of the elder, the alternative funding plan, which actually makes it possible for family doctors to practice home-based care, home-based primary care. So we have two conflicting challenges. We have a growing, growing numbers of housebound patients and the majority of physicians who are office-bound. So why is home-based care important? Well, frail seniors are eventually unable to make office visits to doctors. They just stop showing up and so they're lost to follow up. And then begun, begins a cycle of bouncing in and out of emergency departments, only being able to access healthcare episodically by calling 911. And that leads to more hospital admissions and readmissions and more prolonged hospital stays and increased rates of institutionalization. And there's a, a lot of evidence to show that home care and home-based primary care are highly preventative and, uh, and cost-effective. And so why should we care? Well, we are facing a demographic tsunami. We've heard it over and over again. And right now, there are 1.5 million Canadians over the age of 80, one of the most rapidly growing segments of the population. And the other important thing is the majority of those people will live out their days at home outside of institutional care. And this is a sobering statistic. Over the next 20 years, the number of Canadians over 65 will double, and the number over 85 will quadruple. So we need to anticipate that and not wait until we're reacting a mess. And if you look at the Canadian population from 1950 to 2050, the blue line represents the percentage of the population under the age of 15, and the red line represents the percentage of the population over age 60. And you can see 1960, big peak in the blue line. Well, that was the peak of the baby boom. So go to 2040, and uh, this is flipped over. And it's basically the baby boomers are going to be, the peak of the baby boom is hitting 80 in 2040. That's not that far away. So we're going to see a lot more people like Betty cutting into their 100th birthday cake. So the consequences of all of this is that we will be faced with a growing population of seniors whose needs will not be met by typical office-based primary care delivery. I'm not saying that every senior is going to need house calls, but we're going to see more and more seniors whose needs will not be met by the way we deliver primary care today. There will be greater and greater demand for home care. So the focus of healthcare delivery will have to shift from hospital into the home. And need a lot more supportive home care services, a lot more PSWs. And I was glad to see that an announcement was made recently to increase the wages of personal support workers because they're actually underpaid. They do wonderful work and it's not recognized uh, and not reflected in, in their remuneration. This is uh, Beverly Taylor, who, when I took this picture, had been a personal support worker with VHA Home Healthcare for 38 years. Very proud of her job, loved what she did, very fulfilled by it, and people like her should be celebrated. We're gonna need a lot more home-based primary care. We're gonna have to see family doctors do more of this, make home visits. And we're gonna to have to work in teams and do provide interprofessional care. And you have here a, a social worker family practice resident, social work student, doing a joint, uh, a joint visit uh, on, uh, on a patient. We're going to need to see more specialty care in the home. And my colleague, Dr. Samir Sinha, the head of, uh, of geriatrics at Mount Sinai Hospital, is doing a comprehensive geriatric assessment in a patient's home, where he met Beverly Taylor. And still talks about it. Very impressed with her.
So one thing I grappled with is how does one go about stimulating change? And increasing awareness is a critical step on the road to, to sustainable solutions. Advocacy is, I think, so much more powerful and subtle than activism. And photography has a venerable history as a tool for social change. And I don't know if you recognize any of these photographs. They were taken in the early 1900s by an American school teacher, Lewis Hine, who um, was part of a movement that was trying to abolish child labor in the United States. And there were lots of petitions going through Congress and lots of statistics and tables and graphs. And they were getting nowhere. But when Lewis Hine began to photograph school-aged children going down into coal mines, coal mines and operating cotton gin machines, things moved very quickly. And it was a major factor in, uh, in, in making, making change. In the 1930s, the devastating effects of the Great Depression were movingly depicted by Farm Security Administration photographers Dorothea Lang and Walker Evans, publicizing the needed reforms of Roosevelt's New Deal. The Roosevelt administration actually went out and hired gifted photographers to go out and show America what was happening in the dust bowls. Take pictures, show us. And the middle photograph, it's, it's known as Migrant Mother, it was taken in 1933, became one of the most widely recognized images of the 20th century. Uh, w. Eugene Smith was uh, a Life magazine uh, photographer who created many memorable photo essays. Um, country doctor, nurse midwife, he documented the horrors of Minamata disease in Minamata Bay and was almost killed by goons hired by the, uh, the chemical company. But it, it led to uh, great change. Dorothy Lang, who photographed my great mother, wrote something that really resonated with me many years ago. And she wrote that only through the interested work of amateurs who choose themes and follow them can documentation by the camera of our age and our complex society be intimate, pervasive, and adequate. And the longtime curator of photography at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, John Sharkovsky, also wrote something that resonated. Among photographers also, most of those who produce the medium's memorable work have dealt with issues from their everyday lives, subject matter that they have known well. So the two key elements here is, are I'm an amateur and I have access to something in my everyday life. And something that would have resonated, it did resonate after the fact, was uh, what June Callwood I read in her obituary in, in 2007. If you see an injustice being committed, you aren't an observer, you are a participant. So I began photographing my patients in 1998 with, with consent and everything above board and didn't really show these images for several years and gave a seminar at U of T which was seen by somebody who knew somebody at the Globe and Mail and a few weeks later they ran a three page story nationally on the Saturday of the Mother's Day weekend called Who Cares and it talked about the plight of housebound seniors in in Toronto. And this opened many doors and it led to the making of a National Film Board documentary and led to many opportunities to, uh, to speak about the issue and to meet people involved in the care of seniors in, in, in many different directions. I, I had no idea how, uh, how, how rich a tapestry of organizations are involved in, in care for the elderly As you heard about before, there was an exhibit at the Royal Ontario Museum. Well, has, has this advocacy had any impact? And I'm going to give you a, a, quick, a quick story of, of how these photographs did stimulate some important change. This is a photograph taken in the Glenville Studio in Toronto, the CBC headquarters in Toronto, uh, in 2006. And, and you see Andy Barry sitting there, who was then the host of Metro Morning, the most listened to radio program in, in Toronto. And he had seen the movie House Calls and he decided to hold a public screening and a town hall discussion and create
create a series of radio programs to raise awareness about the whole issue. And uh, I created a very nice website, and it did stimulate interest and awareness. In the following, uh, the following year, the Minister of Health was being interviewed about emergency room wait times, and, and he actually spoke about the need to deliver more care to the elderly in their homes so they can remain independent longer, and that this was an answer to keeping people out of emergency rooms. <coughs> And I had just read this article when my phone rang, and it was a producer from Metro Morning saying, Andy would like to interview you in about 20 minutes. Can you make yourself available? And so we spoke about the home-based care for all seniors and how it would be wonderful to work in an inter inter interdisciplinary team with nurses, social workers, occupational therapists. And the power of radio, radio is a more powerful medium than, than television, much more powerful. And because all kinds of people are listening to the radio when they're driving into work, getting ready for work, you're not watching television as you drive into work, are you? Uh, and so a program like Metro Morning has an early window and a lot of people hear it. So a few days later, I, I get a, an email from uh, the president and CEO of VHA Home Healthcare, one of the largest not-for-profit home care and nursing providers in, in Ontario, saying VHA would be pleased to partner with you and others in the future, particularly our nurses, could be of good use and integrated into ongoing care. And the next day I got an email from Trish Barbado, uh, the then president and CEO of Coda Health, which was providing all of the occupational therapy services uh, for home care in, in, the, in, in much of the GTA. I would like to discuss the possibility of our therapists assisting you in some way. Now, I was working based loosely with a community support services agency in my area that has social workers. So I went to the executive director and I said, you know, I've heard from these two people. You have social workers. What do you think of the idea of a multi-agency collaboration? He said, great. So we called the meeting and it was amazing because the decision makers were around the table and in a, it took about 10 minutes to come up with a plan. And, uh, and that was that we would start a pilot project and CODA would donate an occupational therapist two days a week for two years and the spring would donate a social worker two days a week and VHA would donate a nurse two days a week. And I said, well, I'll close my office practice, which didn't go over well at home. <laughs> it's not the best business decision, but from an advocacy point of view, it was, a, it was a fantastic decision. So we started operating in January 2008, and uh, we uh, started working with uh, Dr. Sheila Naismith, who's a professor of social work at, at U of T, and uh, who was our, our research partner. And this uh, generated interest in the press, and, Toronto Star reporter spent a day doing home visits and writing about the whole thing and meeting other members of the team and seeing the power of interdisciplinary care. Well, the Aging at Home strategy was launched and we applied for funding and in the second year we received funding. And uh, so we um, developed a, 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 the, the same model that we had been uh, working on as a pilot, and that was to have a, a physician-led interprofessional team based in a community support services agency, so based in the community, not a hospital outreach program. So House Calls provides ongoing, comprehensive, interdisciplinary home-based care to frail, marginalized, and cognitively impaired and housebound seniors who would not otherwise have access to primary care. So, these are people for whom this is a necessity, not a convenience. We would be overwhelmed if we simply did this as a convenience. So we're very fussy about who we accept. If you can go to the doctor, you don't need home-based care. So, who are our patients? Well, they're a very heterogeneous group, and they really have 
medical, cognitive, and you know, medically, cognitively, and socially, uh, they're, they're med med medically, cognitively, and socially fragile. And their needs are not well served by traditional office-based uh, primary care delivery. So housebound, housebound is a term I don't really like because it makes you think that people are physically unable to leave their homes. But what if you're cognitively impaired and you have no social supports, but you've been living in the same apartment for the last 30 years, you kind of know where to buy milk. And, you know, your, your patterns are all intact, but you don't know what day of the week it is, so you can't keep appointments, so you stop going to the doctor because you can't. You know, so you're lost, lost the follow-up, and you stop taking all your pills, and your chronic medical conditions are not being treated. And, you're just as vulnerable as the person who's physically housebound. So we developed a little tool. So think of three circles, medical frailty, cognitive frailty, and social frailty. And if you fall into two or more of those circles, you're going to need home-based care. So we started off with a social worker, an occupational therapist, a nurse practitioner, and a physician. And we work very closely with many PSWs because they are the eyes and ears of our patients. They see our patients much more often than we do and alert us to changes. And sometimes it can be pretty subtle when somebody's starting to, to, to deteriorate. So today, our team has for 11, 11 people, we've gone from four to 11. So we have a social worker, two occupational therapists, a physiotherapist, a rehabilitation assistant. Hi, Teresa. <laughs> a nurse practitioner, we're now three family physicians, a team coordinator, and a, and a project manager. And since 2009, we've enrolled over 700 patients into the program. We currently carry a caseload of uh, 260 and growing. The average age of our patients is 87. On an annual basis, we're taking care of over 400 uh, patients. A third of our patients come to us on discharge from, uh, from an acute care hospital admission. They suffer from multiple comorbidities, and we have a high rate of attrition. And when I say attrition, we have two endpoints. We take care of people until they're either admitted to long-term care or they die. Palliate our own patients. We uh, have uh, some, some evidence to support this model, and uh, this is very recent data. We looked at 149 patients that were enrolled into our program following an index acute care hospitalization and were active in the program for over 30 days. So that means people who were admitted into our program after an admission to hospital. And those 149 patients had an average age of 87. And they had an age-adjusted Charleston comorbidity index of 8.4. What that means, that's a research tool used to look at predicting the mortality of multiple comorbidities. So what that number says is these people would be predicted to have an 85% mortality in one year. So they're old and they're sick. Of the 124 patients that were active in our program for more than 90 days, so we, we figured that, you know, you needed several months of home-based primary care to really have a, an adequate exposure to home-based care. I mean, if you were in our program for three weeks, did we really make a big difference or not? But if you were in our program for more than three months, I think, I think we had a chance to make a difference. So enrollment was associated with a 65% annual reduction of days in hospital. So 13.5 fewer days per hospital per patient. So a day in hospital costs a thousand bucks, right? And if you multiply 124 by 13.5 by a thousand, that's $1.7 million. So that's a saving of $1.7 million a year with part of the case load. That's playing, playing a little fast and loose academically, but uh, a 
exposure to, to, uh, to home visits also uh, resulted in 54% fewer hospital admissions per year. And these people, even though they had a high predicted uh, mortality, were active in the practice for an average of 13.6 months. And all this by receiving an average of two house calls a month by multiple disciplines. Of the 25 patients who were active in the program for 30 to 90 days, 64% were lost because of death. And half of those deaths occurred at home. And that's uh, well above the non-institutional death rate of 20% in Ontario. So 80% of deaths in Ontario occur in a hospital or, or a long-term care facility. So the conclusion is that home-based primary care for homebound older adults can significantly reduce uh, hospital care and uh, afford patients the opportunity to die at home when initiated soon after acute care hospitalization. We do a lot of teaching and training. Uh, we provide clinical placements for all disciplines. And since 2009, we've had uh, over 100 medical trainees uh, 80 of them family medicine residents who've spent almost 300 full days working one-on-one -on -one with, uh, with an MD. And two former family medicine residents have, have subsequently joined the team and several other family medicine residents are, are very heavily engaged in providing home-based primary care. So it does, teaching does affect future practice patterns, so it's very important to do that. In May of 2010, Mr. W was referred to our program. He was not able to get up to, you know, get out to see his family doctor. He was declining. We got in and <coughs> sorted things out and optimized his treatment and provided him with a good occupational therapy and uh, improved his mobility. And I want to, I want to ask you, how, how old do you think this man is? Anybody want to hazard a guess? There are no wrong answers. <laughs> I, I didn't hear that. <laughs> Any guesses? We have 190. 109? <laughs> wow. No, I said 90. 90. Okay. I see it's 101. But oh, wow. It still has a twinkle in its eye. <laughs> and loves to flirt with young family medicine residents in a very, very gentlemanly way. It's quite something to see, this older European approach to... Uh... And this guy uses the internet, he's writing a book, he's optimistic about the future, though he says, you know, as I sit here in this rented corpse of a body. <laughs> well, that same month, uh, the house calls exhibit opened at the wrong. And uh, a lot of people came to the opening, including people involved in, in policy development in the minister's office, in the premier's office. And uh, the exhibit was not just about, a, you know, here's a social problem. It was very much about, here's, a, here's an approach to caring for people. It's not just talking about the problem, but talking about the solution. And it was, a, I think, a very powerful approach, and one that, that generated very positive responses from policymakers. Uh, Barbara uh, is a patient uh, still under our care, and her husband was initially referred to referred to our office and uh, our, our program. And um, Ross had been uh, in a nursing home after losing a leg to uh, diabetes and peripheral vascular disease, and was separated from his wife. Really hated, they hated living apart. So their son converted his living room into a bedroom and made it possible for both of his parents to move in with him. But it was a different part of the city, and their previous family doctor, who did do home visits, was now no longer available to them. And, and Carrie, their son, was phoning around and asking different practices in the area, you know, would they come and see his father? He was laughed at, he was ridiculed, he was told doctors haven't done house calls in 35 years. And somebody told him to call Sprint, and we got involved. And uh, Ross and Barbara um, were 
both both had a lot of medical comorbidities that were not being addressed. Barbara had undiagnosed and, and uncontrolled congestive heart failure and became our patient as well. And you see a photo there that Barbara's holding, and that's a picture. Ross and Barbara grew up on the same street in Parkdale. And they're 13, that's Easter Sunday, and they're 13 years old. And uh, they started dating when they were 17, and they got married in their early 20s and raised a family on the same street that they, they grew up in. And uh, so they were, you know, they had a, a long life together, and, and Ross, unfortunately, uh, passed away after losing his second leg, unfortunately. And uh, about six weeks after his death, I got a call from, from Carrie on a Sunday morning that his mother was coughing and short of breath. And I went and saw her, and she had pneumonia, and her congestive heart failure was worse. And, and, uh, and the, 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 the thing in this photograph is the chair on the left was Barbara's chair. After Ross died, she moved into his chair. And to this day, she will only sit in that chair. And I saw her last week in that chair. Uh, she gets pneumonia about twice a year. And over the last five years, I have treated her at home. She has not required a hospitalization. So that's probably at least 10 times that she's been treated very rapidly for her pneumonia and the worsening of her congestive heart failure. And, uh, and that's prevented a lot of hospitalizations. Joyce uh, uh, lived uh, just south of the 401 off Young Street. And uh, one of her neighbors uh, realized she was having problems because she, she, she asked to be able to come use her telephone because her phone wasn't working. And she didn't know to dial the area code. So the, the neighbor realized something was wrong went into her apartment and there were all these unpaid bills and the place was a mess. So the neighbor called Sprint, a community support services agency, and social work came and saw Joyce and Joyce said to her, I never know what day it is. I just get up and go out. Joyce would walk from Young in the 401 down to Young in Eglinton and, and, and hang out in the mall. And uh, very spry, very spry woman. And the social worker contacted me and went and visited Joyce with her. We found some pill bottles that were 10 years, 10 years out of date. So she had been lost to medical follow-up for a decade. And she had a, she had a scar on her neck, a carotid endorectomy scar. So it meant she had a clogged artery up into the brain. So she had some vascular, uh, vascular dementia as a result of cerebrovascular disease. And, uh, that's our, our social worker with, with Joyce. And uh, we got her, instead of going to the mall, one block north of there, Sprint runs an adult day program for cognitively impaired seniors. And it provides a, a, a safe environment, stimulation, a warm lunch. And Joyce did a lot better with that, with meals on wheels at home. She wasn't eating well. And uh, we got arranged for a personal support worker to go in every morning help her take medications from the blister pack to control her horrendous high blood pressure that was you know, now under control. And she was also uh, um, had, was profoundly hypothyroid, though very energetic. She had a T TSH of 96 when I met her, which was unbelievably high. So she managed uh, very well, but she occasionally went to the mall and somebody, we don't know who it is, befriended her in the mall and helped her get a credit card and went with her to the jewelry store in the mall and made a very large purchase. And uh, you know, that kind of elder abuse is not uncommon. People befriending, you know, lonely, cognitively impaired seniors and, and taking advantage of them. Uh, she also um, would go out on days when she shouldn't go out in the winter when it's slippery and she fell and hurt herself and Stacy tried to convince her to use a transportation service but that didn't go over very well. And uh, she started to get on the subway and not know where to get off and the police uh, found her twice in parts of the city far removed from her 
she should have been. And uh, Sprint also runs uh, a supportive housing program for cognitively impaired seniors, and, and uh, Joyce was able to move into this not-for-profit uh, place and, and spent uh, two very good years there. And uh, it's a program run by PSWs and recreational therapists. So it's not a it's not a nursing home. It's not a retirement residence. There are no nurses on staff. And uh, she did very well there. And she was able to continue to uh, to attend the adult day program. And that young lady volunteering is my daughter. <laughs> and Joyce, unfortunately, her dementia progressed, and she eventually. Uh, Moved to uh, to long-term care. John was uh, at the age of 79 shuffled into a downtown emergency department, complaining of foot pain, and he was referred to CCAC, who sent in an occupational therapist, who happened to be the new occupational therapist on our team, and so he was referred to our program, and he was one of the first patients we we took into our pilot program, and. Uh, Leslie walked into his apartment and was confronted by this and called me and said, help. And, you know, it looks like hoarding, but what, what, it's organized, right? Look at those coils of rope on the ground next to the Javex bottles on top of the layers of cardboard. He had built an L-shaped trench, and he's at the apex of the trench. And I, I asked John, I said, what? What did you do? He was, he fought in the Korean War. And I asked, what did you do? He said, I held the line, which meant he was in the front line trenches on the front lines. And at night, if the sentry fell asleep, North Koreans would sneak in under the wire and slit everybody's throat. So falling asleep meant death. So he has layers of cardboard on the floor so that if they take off their boots, I hear the crinkling of the cardboard. And those bottles really do have Javex in them. And those coils of rope are there. So, you know, he catches someone, he'll tie them up and pour Javex on them. <laughs> so this poor guy was suffering from flashbacks, you know, post-traumatic stress, and some cognitive impairment. And you would ask him, you know, how are you doing? All well, the maneuvers didn't go well last night. And he was extremely socially isolated. No telephone, no television, no radio. He had no keys to his apartment. And uh, uh, hadn't been taking any medication for many years. And uh, he, uh, with some social stimulation, going to the adult day program and getting proper nutrition for Meals on Meals, he really improved. And he, Sadly, when he, we met him, he was living on store-bought muffins and his you know, fridge and freezer full of empty muffin containers and water bottles. So, you know, he was vitamin B12 deficient and iron deficient and, you know, with, with some meals on meals, he, uh, he did a lot better. And all he could tell me about his medical history was, I used to take diltiazem and Coumadin. So he had atrial fibrillation, and he was taking an anticoagulant. So he had heart disease and cerebrovascular disease. And it's ironic that his apartment building was in the shadow of the national headquarters of the Heart and Stroke Foundation. Right at Young and Eglinton, in the heart of the best served city in the country. You know, here two Mercedes is vying for the parking spot I have my tripod in. <laughs> So we talked to John about getting, you know, his apartment decluttered, and he consented to having an extreme clean service come in. And when I brought it up to him, he said, yeah, just bulldoze it all into Lake Ontario. <laughs> he had no problem letting go of any of this stuff, which is also hoarding people who hoard won't part easily with their stuff. But he no longer felt threatened. And this is the very same picture taken from the same place with the same lens. His apartment was completely decluttered and he continued to attend the adult day program. He did well for about two years and then he had a massive stroke. And I took this picture uh, the day he was buried. And in the background, the pyramidal structure is the National uh, Korean War Memorial.
memorial. And uh, so he was a soldier until the very end. And a very anonymous man who did a service to, to bring attention to people like him and was on the cover of Canadian Family Physician. That photograph was sent to every family doctor in Canada. It's also in May of 2010 when the wrong exhibit opened, uh, the reporter came on home visits and wrote another story about home-based primary care. And this little flurry of publicity and the opening of the exhibit uh, led to the uh, Lieutenant Governor coming and touring the exhibit and meeting the House Calls team. And that, was, that was kind of exciting for us. And uh, in that same month, the Minister of Health came to Sprint and learned about community support services. And I, had, I was given 15 minutes to talk to her about home-based primary care. And I think that planted some important seeds. Uh, in September of 2010, Mr. W was admitted to hospital. He came down with uh, pneumonia and became weak. He couldn't walk and his son called 911. And uh, this led to my meeting Dr. Samir Sinha and forging a partnership with the, the Division of Geriatrics at, at Mount Sinai Hospital. We expanded our catchment area covering almost a third of the city of Toronto. And uh, began transitioning patients from eMERGE and acute care beds back into the community by providing them with home-based primary care. And Dr. Sinha uh, does uh, consults in the home and supports our team with, uh, with advice as well. So it's a shared care model. So we've, we've developed a hybrid model of interprofessional home-based primary and specialty care. We also try very hard if our patients need to be admitted to hospital, we try very hard to get them into Mount Sinai. So Continuum of care is uh, the, you know, the loop. The loop stays intact, and this model provides uh, excellent teaching, training, and research opportunities. And here's Dr. Sinha making a, a house call. And uh, three months after Mr. W got out of hospital, he had his you know three-month follow-up assessment at home. Uh, medication review and, and you know here's a man at 101 who holds court who's you know those books behind him tell you a story about the wealth of knowledge and the love of learning and a very bright active mind and I, I don't know how many of you have met Dr. Sinha but it's sometimes hard to get a word in edgewise and here Dr. Sinha's doing the listening so, Working, at, working together led to a whole flurry of, of uh, interest in media. And uh, here is, uh, here's some pictures of Dr. Sinha doing consults on, on our patients in the Golden Mail, Consumer Magazine. And, and then uh, in June of 2011, Barbara had a comprehensive assessment, geriatric assessment at home, and uh, an occupational therapist came, and Dr. Sinha did his thing, and uh, we optimized Barbara's uh, care and treatment. And I visited uh, a couple of months later, and I brought with me someone who has become a very strong proponent of home-based primary care, and that's the Minister of Health, Deb Matthews. And uh, she spent 45 minutes uh, with Barbara. She held a press conference uh, talking about bringing house calls back and uh, promising to increase the funding for physician home visits. And uh, Dr. Katya Heineck had just joined the team three, three weeks uh, earlier, and she was explaining to the Minister of Health why she decided to become a home care physician. And uh, interestingly, the two doctors who joined our team are, are graduates of MAC. So you, you, you did something to them here in Hamilton. We did something to them in Toronto, so it's a good combination. And as a result of that press conference, uh, there was a cover story in the uh, Toronto Star about the rebirth of, of house calls. And, and Dr. Sabrina Akhtar, who did several rotations with us, has developed her own home-based primary care program at Toronto Western Hospital, and was also training residents in, in home-based care. 
Um, a group of us applied for funding uh, to uh, study uh, um, 500 patients over a three-year period. Uh, so six family health teams that all have uh, home-based primary care programs. Some of them are very small. They only have six patients. Some of them have 30 patients. But together, we have uh, 500 patients that we're following and uh, just trying to make the point we're asking the question, does home-based primary care reduce hospitalizations? And is it a cost-effective approach? So we cover more than half the city of, uh, of Toronto, and uh, we'll have results probably in a year or two. We saw some promises uh, from the government about uh, providing more care at home and uh, to develop a senior strategy with an expansion for house calls. And uh, indeed, in May, the Minister of Health uh, visited the acute care for elders uh, unit uh, at Mount Sinai Hospital and had a tour with, uh, with Dr. Sinha. It, interestingly, the gentleman in the middle is Dr. Bruce Leff, who is uh, uh, an American geriatrician and uh, the man who developed the hospital in the home model. And uh, at Johns Hopkins also developed a home-based primary care program. So, uh, So a press conference was held to announce that uh, Dr. Sinha would be Ontario's expert lead for the Seniors Care Strategy. And uh, a few days later, the Minister of Health made another house call on one of our patients to make further announcements and was again exposed to so the retired physician who had been had a prolonged hospital admission with end stage congestive heart failure and he wanted to go home and die at home and we took care of him for seven months at home and we were able to support him and support his wish to die at home under his own terms and so the minister of health heard some some very direct messages from this man who was very bright very cognitively intact and, and adamant that he never wanted to go back to the hospital and without interprofessional care and medical care at home, there's no way that he could have been supported at home. The summer of 2012, we were able to expand our program because of a three-year grant from the Greenshield Canada Foundation, the Health Innovation Collaborative. And that allowed us to add more administrative help, a second occupational therapist, a physiotherapist, and subsequently we were able to add uh, a rehabilitation assistant to help stretch the effectiveness of our rehabilitation team. So we have a strong rehabil rehabilitation team in our program that works very collaboratively, so it provides intensive rehabilitation. And that's something that's very needed in the community. It's kind of what happens in, in a rehab hospital, but it doesn't really happen in the home care system that same intensive way. And that summer, a third physician joined our team. And in December 2012, Dr. Sinha submitted his report to the minister, uh, the senior strategy, titled Living Longer and Living Well. It's a document that's available online. And uh, gives a, a very good overview of the problems and challenges and, and some unique solutions. And indeed, in April of 2013, uh, another $280 million in home care funding was announced. And the press conference was held at Sprint, and the Premier, the Minister of Health, and the Minister of Finance came and made the announcement. And we, uh, we now have a Care of the Elderly Alternative Funding Plan, which was promised and agreed to in 2004, and I got my first paycheck in January 2014. So I can finally say that I get properly compensated for doing home-based primary care. Because under fee-for-service, it just doesn't work very well. Fee-for-service is a piecework model. So if you have to see complicated patients that are more time-consuming, and you have to travel on your own time between those patients, that's about the worst way to practice fee-for-service medicine. So, the, the province uh, has initially funded only nine full-time equivalents and uh, will 
be open applications in three years. So we've started very small, but at least you can make a, a business case. And the minister continues to talk about expanding home care for seniors and, uh, and said that uh, home care is the single greatest beneficiary of new health care funding. And indeed, uh, the health care budget, uh, within the health care budget, uh, hospital spending is frozen, physician payments are frozen, but home care funding is increased. So in a way, what the minister is doing, in it, or has done, is to shift funding from hospital and physicians into the community. And we're in the process of uh, forming a, a working partnership with Toronto EMS and their community paramedicine program, and we will be embedding uh, a community paramedic into, into our team, and we just received uh, a one-year grant to do that. So we now have 11 and almost 12 uh, members of the team and we've expanded our catchment area further. So those of you who know Toronto well, we go from almost the junction on the, on the west to the, uh, to the Don Valley in the east and from the 401 to almost the lake. So that's over a third of the city of Toronto. And uh, well, we'll keep growing until we can't do more. So, we have a bit of a problem, and that is our only stable funding is the aging at home strategy funding. And we get just under half a million dollars a year, and that funding was to fund four, well, four, four people, a social worker, an occupational therapist, a nurse practitioner, and a team coordinator. And that was based on the caseload of one physician in 2009, when our caseload was 80, we took care of 100 35 people that first year. Now our caseload is approaching 270 and we're taking care of over 400 uh, people per year with that very same budget. And we did have some temporary funding from Green Shield, but that runs out in, in, a, in a year. So we need an additional half a million dollars a year to sustain our program and to sustain growth. So if anyone here is interested in Ten million dollar endowment. Uh, your, your name, your name will 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 be immortalized in the best home-based primary care program in the country. So, so despite being successful and cost-effective and having some impact on provincial policy, we're still, you know, no further ahead in terms of our funding. We're much further ahead in terms of acceptance and recognition. So I ask myself, why? Well, a program like House Calls challenges the status quo. And when you challenge the status quo, there are a lot of people and interests that are entrenched in maintaining the status quo. Uh, there are those who fear the medicalization of the home care sector, and that's a large and powerful sector. And there's a lot of money at stake. And people know that when doctors get involved with something, doctors want to run it. You can't control doctors, right? Well, I took this picture two weeks ago with my iPhone. It's the only digital camera I own. I only shoot film. So this thing, it's not really a camera. But uh, this is uh, Santa Croce in Florence. And it's an important church. Um, Michelangelo was buried there. He's buried there. Galileo Galilei is buried there. Rossini is buried there. Marconi. And also one Niccolo Machiavelli. And Machiavelli wrote a book, The Prince, 500 years ago, which, after a lifetime as a backroom operative and political advisor, he wrote the ultimate how-to manual for ruling and wielding power. And the whole concept of political expediency comes out of that work. But, it also applies very much today. It's a very topical book. Uh, its, its concepts are, are, are timeless. And what the book helps you understand is that people in power will do what helps them. It's not always about doing the right thing. It's about doing what's politically expedient. So it helps you understand 
that those of us who are less powerful can influence those of us, those with more power, by making it politically expedient to do the right thing. So I think that is where advocacy done properly and done intelligently can make doing the right thing politically appealing. And I don't just mean with politicians, I mean with you know, senior policy people, people who control the purse strings. And so I wanted to visit his grave and pay homage to him. And uh, my son took that, that picture of me. So we're going to end with a short clip from the National Film Board of Canada documentary that kind of gives you a flavor of what this has all been about. would be 
admitted to hospital and would be much sicker than they would have been had there been an earlier intervention. So providing home care makes good fiscal sense. It's not only humane, but it's cost effective. Yep, just have a seat up here. Okay. Okay. There we are. Comfortable? No, my buttocks hurt. Okay, I couldn't help uh, but over here, Bill. Yeah. Tell him about the fall. So what? Uh, what happened? What am I going to tell you? Did you hit your head, or did you land on your bones? No, I believe I fell like this. I hurt my head here. Okay. I think this is a, a very good reason for you to not venture out too much in the winter. If you slip and fall, you can break uh, your head. Okay. You offered very kindly so to come and see me when I need you. And you finally accepted. I've been offering for several years. Well, I think it was a point of pride that you know, she could come to me. Uh, and by my going to her, it was an acceptance that she was frailer and less mobile than she thought she was. So, Mrs. Reno, I'd like to take a, a, spend a few moments taking uh, your picture yes. here in the examining room. Yeah. Because from now on I'm going to come and see you at home. Okay. So I wanted to get the last the last picture on this table. The beauty, right? So. The beauty. I mean, even if you grow old and you are in pain, you don't have to be bitchy. You see, that's a bitchy face. What is that? exotic species in another world. You're looking at your future. Well, that's it. Thank you very much.